You, you raised um, a, a huge issue which we will only touch on, but the invisible disabilities of mental health are not actually included in the 650 million people figure. So when you add, according to the research that I've read, the invisible disabilities and mental health issues, you're actually looking at a number which is even larger. So it's, I guess that, that's worth keeping in mind. Or you want to jump in? Luis, you may have to get out of my way here. Okay, so you st I'll hold the mic so you've got, um, I guess you don't need to. Mi nombre es Ernesto Escobedo. My name is Ernesto Escobedo. Soy presidente de la Unión Mexicana de Sordos. Mexican Union of uh, Deaf People in Mexico. <coughs> he wants to know who is talking. So he realized that now that he has two eh, veo voice lo que eh, quiero felicitar I por este podium. This panel. Y me visualizo, and I visualize pero estoy un poco myself, preocupado. But I am worried. En el mundo, in the world, más o menos hay 6,000 personas 6, en el que no tienen, un alto porcentaje no tiene educación. Have, that have no education. ¿Cómo How podemos hacer para que el, a estas personas y sobre todo a las personas con discapacidad que no tienen acceso a la educación no puedan tener una información real sobre el VIH SIDA? Porque es algo que debe de ser importante para todas las personas, sobre todo para las personas que sobre todo, para, sobre todo para las personas que somos doblemente dis discriminadas por una discapacidad, por a lo mejor por una preferencia sexual diferente. Por ejemplo, en For México, example, in Mexico, en la lengua de señas, Mexican ni siquiera es respetada language. para empezar. Y entonces, no lo podemos And llegar a esta clase de población con información real sobre el VIH. Who would like to address this question of, of education on HIV AIDS within dis disability communities? Because, of course, education is one of the fundamental challenges when you don't have access. It's one of the primary things that people don't have access to. Is there someone on the panel who wants to speak to this? You're pointing, Matilda, at whom? Uh, education is a major issue. Um, people with disabilities, uh, again, we, numbers are lacking, but we think that, um, that uh, the global literacy rate for persons with disabilities may be as low as 3%. And for disabled women, the literacy rates may be as low as 1%. Younger uh, children, uh, younger generations have had a little more education, but not much. And most people with disabilities leave school long before they get enough education to be, under, to be able to understand health messages, um, and certainly long before anything like sex education is addressed in the schools, if it is available to, at all. However, um, this is not a unique challenge. People who work on AIDS issues know and have long experience reaching out to populations with very little education or no education, and women in particular. And so what we can do is also mobilize some of the issues, some of the uh, knowledge we already have uh, from the AIDS community on how to reach populations with no education about these issues. Education has been one of the barriers that even has been experienced, especially among us, the deaf community. The low level of education, again, it also has an intersection with the low knowledge on HIV and AIDS information. Due to this challenge of low level of education, and especially the messaging of the HIV and AIDS information, most of the deaf, deaf people, you do realize they cannot even read or even write. So due to this low level of education, HIV and AIDS messaging that is done by the AIDS community sometimes, it's even putting the people with the deaf people even at a more risk. Because like us, an example of me, I think I took three years after high school to just get to understand English in details. And I'm a living example of that. I took three years after high school, still struggling with even like addressing the messaging of HIV and AIDS, trying to really like understand the IEC materials that are around. Sometimes, when even we are implementing our programs as Liverpool VCT, one of the challenges our peer educators are getting on the ground is really making those messaging to be very friendly even to the grassroots deaf who have not gone to school. 
which again needs more resources to carry out mobile activities that will be more supportive. I think also we really need to have like more educational approach in doing awareness among these people with disabilities in our response. You ready? Hi, I'm Lilian Galvão from Brazil. We are doing a program, an education program with uh, special needs who lives with uh, intellectual disabilities. So I would like to see next conference a people with intellectual disability in here talking with us because it, they can do it very, very well. So uh, our project uh, called PIPA, PIPA is kite in English. The people with intellectual disabilities say that kite means uh, freedom, uh, empowerment, and choice love. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to, oh, go ahead, yes. I got the mic. Oh, hello, my name is George Chuckman. I'm, I work with an organization called International Service. And one thing which I haven't heard yet is we've, we've talked about how, how international NGOs, how different organizations can work, include um, disabled people into their work. But what about uh, not just including disability awareness, but also including that disabled people, for example, are included in the hiring practices. So that way, uh, uh, funding organizations, international NGOs, universities, whatever government entities, that they have disabled people working amongst them. So that way, the, the learning process and the, the exchanges are on a constant level. One experience I had from Bolivia is when we, we have a project manager who's um, in a wheelchair. And it wasn't only about just making sure there are ramps at, at the office. It also included about the integration of all this, uh, uh, issues around disability into the, uh, with children, with HIV AIDS, with sex and reproductive health. It was about making sure that the cups were put lower so that way they, she could access it. It was about really simple things that you wouldn't think about until you spend time with disabled people. Thank you. I'm coming back over here. Thanks. Marilyn. Thank you. Um, I'm Marilyn Waring from New Zealand. And I have um, a question that I'd like some help with. Uh, I've uh, often worked in development programs and tried to use the Civil and Political Covenant, CEDAW, now the Disability Covenant, uh, in the, um, the work to try and force both the donor, whether it was a multilateral agency or um, one of the Western countries, and the um, partner to be obliged to uh, undertake their human rights commitments in the programs in which I'm involved. I'm immediately told that I'm enforcing a conditionality. And so um, it, it doesn't bother me, I go ahead anyway. And most of the countries that you work with have been reckless enough to put equal, equality um, articles in their constitutions so that it's very difficult for them to argue with you. But if anybody has any really good advice about how to keep the rights pressure on so that, for example, we confront NZAID, AusAid, CEDAW, all the UN agencies um, in terms of those rights obligations, but also how from a bottom up, do we force the partner countries also to have to accept those without the, the nonsense about conditionality? You may be the only person in the room who can answer the question that you've asked. I hope that's not the case. No, no, lots of people on the panel have some thoughts. Go ahead. Okay, I think conditionality comes uh, in everything when there are resources involved. Uh, there, there, are no, uh, there is no free lunch, almost never. But in UN, uh, the experience that we have in the negotiation of the convention was that, I go back, civil society has a key role to end with that conditionality. Uh, in the negotiations of the convention, disabled people was head of delegations, heading delegations. There was a caucus of disabled people giving opinions of each and every word that is into the convention. 
and uh, the countries at the end have to do uh, what uh, the civil society asks. I think that's a tendency. Uh, in some countries it's a lot slower than in others. Uh, I was uh, talking with uh, very developed countries uh, within the negotiations and uh, they didn't understand why in Mexico we were still caring about uh, intellectual discapacity because uh, a, a person can uh, uh, be abused by their own family when they are hurting a house or anything. So it's very complicated, but I think civil society has a key role. And there is another big issue that we have, countries and civil society, that is the secretariats of the organizations. Sometimes it's more difficult to move a secretariat and uh, the, the, the decisions that they make than to push a country to a, a put in, inside the organization a priority. But I think things have to be moved. Go ahead, Yetne Bursch. Well, uh, most of the things have been raised by Matilde, but I want to say some points. One is in the, within the UN Convention, I don't know from where you are exactly, I think from New Zealand you said, well, New Zealand was very active, and I, I, I would like to recognize your, your country's role in the, in the enactment of the convention. But uh, if, if I don't think the convention is yet ratified in New Zealand, uh, uh, because there are two kinds of ratifications. One is uh, pre-reform I mean, pre ratification. That is like uh, countries ratify first the convention, and then they reform their laws, uh, like Hungary, even Mexico, I hope so. They, they follow this kind of trend. But some countries make a post-reform ratification, like Finland, for example. They are reforming their laws before they ratify the convention. They take this kind of measures, and maybe we can share later on. So they have, there is post-reform and pre-reform. But in terms of uh, the conditionality, what I would like to say is if, it's the, if the convention is ratified, there is a monitoring body. A statement about Mont I think it's Article 38 or 37, but it deals with establishing a monitoring body, like a watchdog, which uh, which follows up on the implementation of those articles. But in case of other CEDAW, uh, UDHR, ICCPR, ICESCR, all these instruments, their base is their human rights documents. Their human rights documents. So the nature of being human rights documents and the nature of person with disabilities are human, that's where we can base our arguments. So in terms of conditionality, one is the human rights. So it's human and the condition to use, to, to be part of this document, to, be, to get a legal protection from doc, this document, being human is enough. We are more than human. <laughs> um, we're running out of time. I'm glad that the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities has come up. It is a, it's a major new development. It does not include language specific to HIV AIDS in it, but it's been ratified by enough countries that it's come into force in international law. We had grand plans have a long discussion about it. I think because we've only got a couple of minutes left, I'm pleased that it, we've, we've addressed it, and it's obviously the subject of a lot, of, of, of a, that needs a lot more discussion. I want to end on something bigger, because I think that what's happening at this conference, and certainly the intent of this session and of the press conference yesterday and of other activities is a question of movements. There's, a, there's an HIV and AIDS movement, and we have to use lots of quotes in these sentences because they're all contested terms. And there's a disability community and movement around the world which has been in existence for decades or more. And this is one movement tapping the other on the shoulder and saying, hello, we're not invisible. In fact, there is huge overlap, not just in the vulnerabilities, not just in the stigmas, not just in the number of people who are disabled and HIV positive or, 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 or suffering from AIDS, but there are overlaps in movement, in how we move governments, in how we mobilize resources, in how we connect with research communities, and that there are huge opportunities here for movements to work together if we can avoid competitions around funding, and around suffering, and around the right to protest and, and to mobilize. So I just want to reflect, and I encourage people in the audience and people in the panel 
to end on this note and to offer your thoughts on what are the opportunities for these two movements. Maybe merging is a little premature, but to intersect, to, to collaborate, and to use what's happened here in Mexico City as the birth of an alliance. How are we going to do that? And for those people in the AIDS community and the audience, what are you moved to do in terms of movements? Who'd like to start? A nice big question. And Eureka, I'm coming. I'm glad that you raised it, Avi. I've been thinking about it as the panel has been discussing. And in particular, I was struck by the language that Washington used. And he talked a lot about decisions not being taken without us. And I, if you go back to the early days of the AIDS conferences, that's what people living with HIV were saying to the so-called experts, to the scientists, politicians, and decision makers who were inside the rooms talking about what should happen and what the response should be for people living with the virus. And it was the people who were infected and affected by the disease who demanded that the door be open and they be part of the decision making. So if anyone knows what it means to be excluded and knows how important it is to be included in the decisions that are made, it's the AIDS movement. It's the people living with HIV. And I think you're absolutely right that this is an opportunity. It's what was said earlier that a light has, has come on, that, that hopefully, maybe, people living with HIV, that people working in the AIDS movement, a light has gone on, and they've realized that, that what has, what's happening now with people living with disabilities are in the exact same position that this movement was in 25 years ago. And it's, we, know, we know more than, than most people what it feels like to be on the outside. So, so let's open that door and let, let people in. I'm here. Oh, actually my point was um, around sexual health and then you went to a new point, but I think it's actually related. Um, I've been following the sexual and reproductive health stream over the course of the conference because I'm a trainer. Um, I live in Namibia and what was really evident to me attending many, many sessions about the limitations and challenges of the ABC approach um, was that people with a disability were missing from all of those panels. And for me as a trainer, as I move forward um, to a more sex positive approach in the way that I'm doing my education around HIV and AIDS, is I'd like to probably meet with a lot of different stakeholders involved in the disability movement to learn how I, myself as a, an educator and a trainer, and the network that I belong to, which is called Kicking AIDS Out, how we can more effectively integrate people with a disability, one, in designing our curriculum, but two, in making our curriculum more meaningful and relevant and also sex positive for people, and specifically youth in my context, um, more sex positive for people with a disability. So I thank you. I've learned a great deal over the course of the past two hours, and uh, I really look forward to working with this community as I move forward. So thank you. Do people on the panel want to address this uh, last question? You've all got mics. You're not shy. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Nabersh, go. Thank you, Evie. Uh, I just want to say, just I, I, I feel it the way that you say it, that the, the, the existence of competition among the two movements. But I strongly say it to you that let's complement each other. That's what we should do. Let's, the HIV AIDS community, complement as the disability movement. Let the disability movement complement the HIV AIDS movement because we are working on human rights issue. Let's see it as if we need you very much because you complement us. You need us. We are very important to you because we complement you. I mean, let's take it in a complementary manner at which the HIV AIDS movement can also learn from the disability movement and the same does the disability movement from the HIV AIDS movement. Thank you. It's hard to disagree when she puts it like that. <laughs> Steve. Thanks, Abby. I just wanted to make a quick point. It took people with disabilities 25 years of lobbying to get through the front door at the UN to begin the negotiations on the convention. That was in 2002. And in 2002, our organizations went to New York and our numbers were about the same as the people in this room. 
four years later, when the convention negotiations were finished, over 400 NGOs were registered to participate in that process. And I think it's very clear that the participation of people with disabilities was the driving force behind the whole convention process. And it seems to me that it's directly analogous to what's happening here, both in terms of time and numbers. So I think that we see ourselves at a Kairos moment. It's a time of great change and a real opportunity. And I think we have a good deal of reason to be positive and optimistic about the future. Now we're getting to closing sentiments. I, I want to bring someone up um, to, to offer a closing thought because I think this panel in some way and some of what's happened here at this conference started, I think, if I've got my history right, when Nora and some others went to the then uh, UN Special Envoy on AIDS in Africa and kicked his butt on the issue of disability and its invisibility. So I would ask, uh, in the spirit of, of nepotism, which is such an important part of NGO work, <laughs> that Stephen Lewis come and tell us a little bit about why AIDS Free World has been trying to put this issue on the map, what the organization intends to do to capitalize on this momentum, and just how good the ass kicking was that Nora delivered in New York many years ago. It was, as you can see, enormously effective. You see the seamless way the microphone moves between the generations? Isn't it a pleasure? Uh, I, uh, I felt and uh, traveled frequently, in particular with uh, my co-director of AIDS Free World, Paula Donovan, and, and Anya Rita. As we traveled around uh, Africa over the years, we did meet from time to time with groups of uh, people who were associations of the blind or associations of the deaf. And one of the things I'll never really forgive myself for was that we did not react, I certainly, and it was my responsibility, did not react with anywhere near sufficient urgency to incorporate associations of people with disabilities into the work on HIV and AIDS. I, I don't know how to explain that or how to rationalize it or how to defend it. It's an embarrassing truth. There was a lot of work to do, obviously, but I never uh, adequately responded. And I think early on when we met with uh, Nora and Steve and, uh, and others, we, both Paula and I, felt that, that this was uh, an issue has, whose time had come and that the procrastination was unendurable. And, uh, and then uh, uh, Paula had this fascinating idea to bring everyone together and use the International AIDS Conference as a vehicle to, uh, to make the complementary movements join. And I think this evening has been a kind of breakthrough. I'm, I'm, I'm tremendously encouraged by what has happened here tonight. Uh, we had a press conference on disabilities and AIDS last Monday and it's been picked up by the media. We had a wonderful intervention on a scientific panel by Miroslava on Wednesday, which uh, has been picked up by the media. Miroslava is quoted extensively in news stories. I don't doubt that tonight is another watershed where there's a, a high understanding that the, that the merging, to the extent that it's possible, and rational of the HIV and AIDS movement with the disability movement, as Avi put it, so that one builds the kind of base which is irresistible hereafter, that we go from meeting to meeting, no longer standing in the margins, no longer peripheral, but absolutely central to the life of the, of the uh, withstanding the pandemic. That really must come out of this, uh, this evening. And do you notice how how remarkably comfortable and, and, and useful the evening has been, uh, how integrated the discussion has been, and, and, and I love that. And, and it just shows what can happen when, when the issues are genuinely placed. So to the extent that AIDS Free World can, can facilitate this and be a part of it, we'd love it, you can rely on us, we'll hurl ourselves into it, Avi is now completely and totally committed. He may indeed give up his job at Al Jazeera and simply enter this compendium of principle and social justice. Uh, I, I, I can't thank all of you enough for coming tonight, and I pledge to you that this uh, fascinating exchange 
and, and obvious engagement will continue. Thank you, son. Thank you very much. Thanks to our panelists, and thank you to a wonderful, wonderful audience.